folks, it's only been like since my last Harry Potter video. No need for introductions because you should have watched the other one first. One year and like three billion dollars later, J.K. Rowling releases the second Harry Potter book. And this time there's no scary words like philosopher in there to confuse Americans. Now, apparently Joanne has said that this book was incredibly hard for her to finish, which makes sense because it's really bad. Hey, have you noticed that the others by the author sections here only advertise Harry Potter books? I wonder why they don't highlight her other works. Boring nonsense and transphobia. Yes, before I get into it, I really want to address the elephant in the room. Surprise, the elephant was JK the whole time. In the months since my Sorcerer's Stone video, some internet sleuths have noticed that Joanne sure does follow a lot of openly transphobic people and occasionally likes really, really shitty tweets. By accident. Unlike IT crowd guy, she's not some sort of frothing loser constantly shitting her pants in public about the issue, but it seems increasingly clear that she at least harbors a lot of apathy towards the issue. So it seems that between me uh, recording this audio and editing this video, uh, J.K. Rowling has chosen to post this particular bullshit on her personal Twitter.com account, so, uh, you know. Haha, <laughs> okay. Back to more fun topics, like how Chamber of Secrets is the book that introduces the weird fucked up slave race to the Harry Potter universe. Yeah, so I know Dobby's story is supposed to highlight just how bad the Malfoys are specifically, but even if you're a free, happy elf working in the Hogwarts kitchens, this depiction of elves is so fucking weird. Magical creatures in general seem to be a lot closer to human intelligence than your average fauna. There's a lot of little details that I don't think were very well thought out, and it leads to wizard society seeming a lot more messed up than JK ever intended. Even without those implications though, the writing in general is just not very good. It starts off early too, with a really unnecessary amount of recapping in the first chapter. I think it's reasonable to expect people to, you know, start a series at the beginning? And including a book's worth of information right at the start doesn't help anyone. This problem continues into the rest of the book with a lot of unnecessary recapping of information that the audience already knows. Lockhart gets hurt the worst by this problem. He's a great character, again teaching kids that just because somebody is handsome, famous, or charming doesn't mean they're to be trusted. However, every time he shows up, Rowling just seems to be unable to contain herself in demonstrating just what a phony piece of shit he is. Long story short, this book is bad. Legitimately bad. Maybe it was my low expectations because of the book, but I didn't hate this. The acting has gotten better across the board, especially with the children. One particularly good moment comes at the end of the flourish and blot scene, where Draco, trying to look cool, pathetically parrots his father's exiting line. See what's cool. Just that little five second shot tells you so much about the Malfoys, about why Draco is such a little loser, and how a parent's bad behaviors are inherited by their children. It's actually... subtle. The CGI also stands out as being significantly better. The Polyjuice transformation is a great example of CGI done right, in fact. It gets rid of the other two Transformers in a believable way so they only had to animate Harry, it's lit pretty dark to hide a lack of detail on the model, and to do this effect practically would be so stupid, expensive, and time-consuming. The comedic aspects work a lot better here too, probably because it's easier to be funny on film than it is on page, and also because JK is a dangerously unfunny person in general. This is a double-edged sword, however, as it again sows the seeds of a problem that will become more and more exacerbated as this series goes on. A lot has been said about Ron's characterization in the films and how what makes him good in the books is sacrificed to turn him into this mean comedy scene generator, and this is where it starts getting really obnoxious. He's got a point, you know. I guess Columbus just thought Rupert's wine would be particularly funny to hear over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And over. <laughs> Overall, I'd say this is probably the most successful adaptation in Harry Potter history, because the absolute dark horse of the book series has somehow translated into a three-hour film that feels a lot shorter than its run length. Now, if only they had chosen not to adapt this absolutely fucking stupid anagram bullshit. We might as well start with the least goodest 3D game from last time. Again, I'm relying on a long play for footage because this is what happens whenever I try to record the PlayStation emulator. From what I can tell, this is the exact same engine as the first, hideous character models and all. God, nice work, Harry. Hope Dad's junk wasn't too much of a problem for you. Ron? What the fuck did you just say to me? 
The weird story compression issues come back in full force here, but in another cosmic twist of fate, some of them are actually good. For example, to save a scene with Hermione in the common room, you instead get these random students talking about the car incident in the hallway. It serves to make the other students less of random set dressing and more of an active force in the world. Considering how much of the books and films are about Harry grappling with his public image within the castle, it's nice to get some of that feeling in one of these games, even if it's by accident. There's also a lot of things that happen off screen, like Ron getting his share of the potion ingredients. Again, it shifts Harry from video game protagonist who does literally everything to just another small part of a larger narrative. Some of it is still very weird though. Like, why do we go to Diagon Alley in the middle of the school year instead of going there at the beginning? Why the hell is Draco already there and setting traps for Harry? It's just very strange. There's also a couple of cool things that this game does that I don't think any other game in the series manages and I couldn't fit it into any other section, so I wanted to put it here. Firstly, the game assumes that Harry actually remembers the things he learned last year and doesn't require you to learn all your basic repertoire again. Secondly, the flu network is an actual playable segment instead of just acting as an instant teleport like in the other games of the film. But besides this, I can't think of any other time besides the books that they actually acknowledge the flu network as being a physical journey that you go through. Oh, and uh, there's this little chase sequence based off a throwaway line in the books, and it's, uh... Oh, you, Harry Potter, stay there. I've got a musical message to deliver to you. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first game in this series that I've managed to record off the actual console. <laughs> Anyway, strangely enough, we've essentially played the sequel to this game already with the Sorcerer's Stone GameCube game, as that came out a year after this one. Boy howdy, it is amazing how much a single year of development can affect the quality of a game. Because besides the story, there's only some subtle differences between the two games. Those small changes though, bring the half-decent standout game of the last session down to probably the worst of this entire batch. There's two bean-related mechanics that combine to truly drag this game down to the darkest depths. Firstly, it's the way you get them out of the environment. All over the place, you'll find random objects that, when hit with Fulpendo, will give you a random number of beans, and those replenish upon loading a new area. This means you can grind beans from a particular zone, you know, if you hate yourself, but the optimal thing to do would be to just save up from the objects you find during normal gameplay. This is where the second mechanic comes in. You see, whenever Harry gets hit, he will lose five beans which fall in a circle around him. That means unless you play perfectly, trying to save up during these levels is excruciatingly tedious. Because it means you have to scoop up your beans whenever you get hit and seek out every single bean generating object in the level. Luckily, the twin store is mostly full of inventory expanders, but if you want that Aloha Mora spellbook, then you're going to have to save up at least 150 beans. And good luck doing that without resorting to grinding. It doesn't help that certain levels, like this Hell Ascent in the library or most of Aragog's lair, pretty much guarantee that your beans are going to be irretrievable. To add further insult to further injury, if there are other students around the sconce you're hitting, oftentimes the beans will land inside of them. I think it's a bad system even in games like Sonic that are actively designed around losing coins. It's a shame because the level design is still really strong. There are some very striking images like this room with the reflective floor and the floating death balls, or freely flying over the castle after you get your broom. I particularly like this moment in Diagon Alley, when you're retrieving things that Ginny dropped while traveling through the flu network. You enter the bar and almost immediately see the thing you're looking for. However, it has somehow landed on the other side of this unsecured trap door that leads to the- Huge cellar, you know. Okay, okay thanks. Thanks, Hagrid. So after securing the door from the bottom, you have to go through the basement to get back upstairs to retrieve the object. It's a lot more interesting than if the fireplace she had dropped her shit out of was just in the basement to begin with. Butterbeer's the best drink in the entire wizarding world. Butterbeer's the best drink in the entire wizarding world. Butterbeer's the best drink in the entire wizarding world. Do I know you? So seeing as this is just a worse version of the Sorcerer's Stone, I think there's really no reason to seek out this game. If you're really itching for this particular engine, this is not the game to play on it. What a weird series of circumstances that brought us to this point, huh? Alright, I'm all 3D'd out, let's get some nice 2D adventures in. Like the first GBA game, this is an isometric action sort of affair. Although this time they actually got the angle right for this hell genre. The environments are very detailed and appealing, looking fittingly whimsical for the most part. I absolutely love the Potter Vault, as instead of being just some regular old room carved out of the rock, it's a natural cave filled with gold. 
The controls are also pretty decent considering the angle and pedigree we're talking about. Most of the time an isometric action game is going to make me crave the sweet release of shutting the game off forever, but I really didn't hate this one. There is one major misstep, however. To switch spells, you need to go into the menu and select them manually. It's like the water temple extended to an entire video game and it drags the whole experience down. Especially considering the level design necessitates you switching constantly, often multiple times per room if you want to collect everything. I didn't. It didn't dawn on me until I was reviewing the footage, but the potion shop in Diagon has the exact same layout as the one from the GameCube version. I looked it up and, lo and behold, they were developed by the same studio at the same time. That explains a lot of the jank of the cube game, and also explains some of the worst aspects of this. Despite the appeal of the graphics overall, there's a lot of lazy aspects. The polyjuice potion just makes the color of your robe change, and there's a lot of reused assets. Some of it doesn't really make any sense too, like what's with this underground classroom and why the hell does it have a troll in it? Both the games reek of a development team spread just a little too thin. It only really has six or seven enemies for the whole adventure, and a lot of the traps get reused as well. And here, people of all ages, I present to you the worst possible render of the Harry Malfoy duel ever made. Beautiful. It's head and shoulders above the first GBA game, but it gets real tedious by the second half. If you play it for the first two hours and then put it down, I'd maybe give it a recommendation, but who on earth is hurting for a half-decent isometric platform? Okay, look, I'm just gonna be straight honest here right now. I barely got an hour into this game before giving up. I'm sorry, I just, I just couldn't do it. It is just so fucking boring and tedious. And it's retelling a story I really didn't like in the first place. Once again, it's nearly the exact same engine as the first, with a couple of improvements. You have party members now, so you're only outnumbered in, like, half the battles instead of all of them. Uh, the graphics are a little bit nicer, I guess? Oh, there is a great little identification system in place so that you can log the strengths and weaknesses of enemies by casting a spell on them, removing a lot of the annoying guesswork from the first game. Uh, okay, I- look, I can't come up with more words about this. If you really have to play a game in this engine, I'd say go with this one because the gameplay is a lot better. But just- uh, look, don't play this game! There are so many other better RPGs that you can- look, you know what? Fuck it, this is a new video now. Hi, welcome, I'm Andy. Uh, this is the top 10 RPGs you should be playing instead of these stupid Harry Potter ones. Number 10, Jimmy and the Pulsating Mass. Save the best for first here. Fun battle mechanics are coupled with some pretty sweet writing. Play as Jimmy as you get scared by all the fucked up shit in the world because you're a 10 year old boy. Soundtrack is absolutely perfect. This little snap on the world map just, ah. Number nine, Hillix, the hardest, easiest RPG you're ever gonna play. Features graphics made out of real life and a bunch of cool magic. Lots of the dialogue is randomly generated. I have no idea what it's about at all. Good time all around. Number eight, all the mother games. Is it fair to put three games on one spot on this list? Fuck yes, these games are excellent. If you're only gonna play one, I'd say make it Earthbound, but the other two are still top tier. Shout out to this sprite that somebody drew in their second grade notebook. Number Slevin, Undertale, and Deltarune. Look, all right, I know, fanbase, bad, whatever. These games are still fantastically written, beautifully scored, wonderful little things. Heartwarming, endearing, scary as shit, metafiction about c characters, heart-based pacifist combat, doggy. Number six, off. Invented by a Belgian. ghost man. One of the best examples of surrealism in video games. Has this cool sketchy aesthetic for the enemy graphics and the greatest song ever composed. I have never once wished to know this much about me. Number five, Mega Man Sprite Comic.exe. Based on this webcomic that I don't like. Here you play as Mega Man Sprite Comic as he gets arrested for not walking on the goddamn path. Shut up. Dumbler 4, Moon RPG Remix Adventure. By the righteous folks who would later go on to make Tulip in a billion mobile games, you play as the ghost of Christmas present as you get sucked into your dumbass fantasy RPG. English version is coming out on Switch for the first time ever, so go buy it. Number three, Space Funeral. The saddest man in the entire world teams up with Leghorse to figure out what in the goddamn hell is even going on. 
has this weird lo-fi soundtrack that perfectly complements the utter chaos happening on every screen. Remember not to give out too much of your blood. Number two, Paper Mario. Nintendo have made a lot of great RPGs over the years, including the much better game Paper Mario 2, not featured on this list. This takes the boring nothing that is the Mushroom Kingdom and transforms it into this wonderfully interesting place full of characters you can actually remember. You solve a penguin murder mystery with fucking Ernest Herringway. <laughs> Number one, Lisa. Save the best for last here, somehow this random martial arts master wrote, composed, and programmed this fantastic beast of a series. Manages dark humor without veering too far into shitty edgelord bullshit? Does dark ass themes like child abuse and suicide some justice without coming off as insensitive? Flips back and forth between the two expertly as well, letting the story moments breathe but still pacing out enough jokes that you want to ride it out. Basically completely pointless at the end. Uh, rest in peace, Whittly 2 Diddly. All right, that's it. Now you don't have to play these stupid ass boring Game Boy games. All right, what was I talking about? Harry, what? Anyway, speaking of saving the best for last, this engine is extremely similar to Sorcerer's, except somehow it runs on modern hardware right out of the box with only a few minor graphical glitches. The controls feel a lot better in my hands this time around, although I don't know if that's because of any significant changes the developers made, or just because I'm running it at the frame rate it was intended. Even if that is the case though, this game is leagues above the first in almost every conceivable way. You see, this is the new Super Mario Bros. 2 of Harry Potter video games because it's all about collecting coins. D beans. Yeah, bean collecting was a major bugbear in regards to the GameCube game, but this one ramps it up to a whole nother level. Also, unlike the GameCube game, this one actually does it well. You see, Fred and George have absolutely flooded the school with merchants to trade with you. The twins themselves are over at the Quidditch pitch selling Quidditch nonsense instead of just giving it to their team so we can fucking win, George. In the grounds and staircase, however, you can find dozens of students standing around doing the exact same weird bean animation. If I have one problem with this system though, it's the overabundance of these students. You can shop around for different prices, but considering they only sell one of four things, I think they really should have cut this number down. But you may be asking, how does one acquire beans? Well, I'll tell you, by explaining something tangentially related. The level design is such a huge step up from the first game, you almost wouldn't believe it's the same team. Not only is there almost always something interesting to look at, but the density of secrets has exploded exponentially. I swear, every single room has some sort of hidden flipendo panel or secret Lumos wall, usually with a wizard card and a chest full of beans for you to dance in front of. Best of all, if you go out of your way to collect the bonus stars and keep up on your house points, you get to enter the bean courtyard to bounce around for a couple minutes. The puzzles are still dead simple, but even this aspect has been improved immensely. Most of the obstacles are just simple machines that you flipendo to move or whatever, but they have a much greater variety of set pieces that are actually interesting. A standout moment is at the beginning of Harry's post polyjuice journey into the dungeons. Here, another student removes the ectoplasm holding up this weird bridge because the Slytherins are just fucking dickheads for no reason. To circumvent this, you climb up the inexplicable moving platforms and open this conveniently placed container of ghost goo, allowing you to stick the bridge back together. Even when they're not as spectacular as this, you still get a decent variety of things to interact with. In the other games, missing a card means having to go back and replay every single level to figure out the secret area or random treasure chest you overlooked. So, you know, fuck that forever. Here, all you need to do is grind for beans and find somebody who's selling the type of card you want. The bronze! The cards just increase your health pool, but the silver cards eventually unlock this door in the grand staircase that leads to some final bonus challenges. These are pretty easy timed affairs that contain the last of the cards in the game. But still, this folio being both easy to complete and actually having an interesting reward at the end is certainly unique for this series. Plus, each card you collect here unlocks one of these massive murals in the hallway, and that's just neat. Oh, they got little skyboxes and everything! So, in yet another odd twist of fate, this is the best Chamber of Secrets game. In fact, this is by far the best game we've talked about in this series, and I certainly did not expect to say that when I started the research. I would go so far as to say that this is a genuinely good video game. It easily runs on modern hardware, and if you're one of those freaks who still has a CD drive, I'm sure you can track down a copy for the cheap. And, uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, goodbye, I love you. Goodbye.
Mrs. Goyle. Want to break other people's presents later? What the fuck?